thank you so much and thank you all for being here. As you know, uh, in this series of uh, lectures, this is the, the last and final one, which means that it is a lecture about conclusions. And in this lecture, what I want to do is actually put my own cards on the table. In other words, what I'm going to do in this last lecture is expose what the philosophy of translation, which is mine, uh, um, um, so, and in so doing, I am going to just lay uh, my cards on the table and say that this is the point of view from which I have been speaking all the way. In other words, if, if and when I publish this, what I'm presenting now might as well be the first uh, or the introductory uh, uh, chapter. So it means that it is going to be more, even more theoretical than what I have been doing until, until now. I'm exposing basically the theory of translation from which I have been uh, uh, working. So in order to do that, let me start with some close reading of French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas and his book entitled Humanisme de l'autre homme, or Humanism of the Other, published in 1972. And in particular, what I want to do is read closely the pages he wrote under the headline Before Culture from his chapter on Signification and Sense. So in the pages of Emmanuel Levinas I am alluding to, he extols elevation and verticality as the mark of universality. Something universal for Emmanuel Levinas is something that is above all cultures, all languages, and so on and so forth. In other words, this is the, his insistence on the verticality and the elevation of the universal. Only, he says, from such an elevated position, an elevated perspective on a signification that could be detached from cultures, can we uh, make a universal judgment precisely on cultures. In other words, in order for us to have anything universal. It has to be detached from the particular cultures and languages that we deal with and be situated somehow above uh, all cultures and languages. So a normal question to ask would be, well, how is such a thing possible? If the only perspective I can have on the word is a perspective from the language that I am speaking at the moment when I speak it, how would be such a location possible which would be situated above all possible cultures and languages? So if one asks that question and asks about the reality of such a perspective outside any particular cultural perspective, the answer of Emmanuel Levinas is well, that location is Western civilization. As simple as that. He says, yes, the decried Western civilization that knew how to understand cultures that never understood anything about themselves. I am here quoting Emmanuel Levinas. So the assumption he is making, the assumption here is that there is a Western civilization which is not so much a culture among other culture or a language among other languages, but the logos itself. Europe cannot just be a province of the world. It has, in some respect, to be something outside cultures and outside the plurality of languages because it is what defines that situation above all of them, the situation of a detached signification. So why is that? Because for him, 
Europe is naturally endowed with some anthropological vocation, the capacity to understand other cultures that have never understood anything about themselves. Because, he says, in its historicity, Europe has had the, I quote again, generosity of liberating the truth from cultural presuppositions, purifying thought of cultural alluviums and language particularism. That is why, that is why, actually, Europe could renounce the violence of colonialism because culture and colonization, I quote again Emmanuel Lemilas, do not necessarily go together. In other words, what we are invited to see is a picture in which you would have, yes, the plurality of human cultures and languages, but, but you, Europe would be in a unique situation of providing the possibility of a perspective beyond all perspectives just because it has come to the point of transparency vis-a-vis -vis itself that not only did, he, did it understand itself, but in so doing, it developed an anthropological vocation and the capacity to understand other cultures in a way that these cultures never understood themselves. They never reached this sort of self-transparency that Europe has reach, and this is why it is normal that European universities would be sending anthropologists all over the world and not receive anthropologists because they have the vocation, the anthropological vocation of understanding other cultures better than those cultures have ever understood themselves. Now, ours is precisely a time of decolonization. And as Levinas writes, this time <coughs> of ours is characterized by the radical opposition against cultural expansion by colonization. And if that comes to mean that even Western cultural expansion has no legitimacy anymore, the result of considering that all cultural personalities realize the spirit by the same rights the French expression is réalise l'esprit au même titre. If we consider that all cultures are a realization of the spirit with capital S in the same way, then the result would be a loss of orientation. Playing on the words Occident and Orient, Emmanuel Levinas writes this, I quote, the word created by this saraband of countless equivalent cultures, each one justifying itself in its own context, is certainly disoccidentalized. It is also disoriented." End of quote. So in a word, this is, in the language of Edouard Glissant, a chaos word except that for Edouard Glissant, a chaos word is something positive. The word has to be a chaos word. In the case of Emmanuel Levinas, if by a post-colonial word, we understand a word in which Europe does not have the kind of unique leadership that its own telos and its own anthropological vocation gives to it, well, that word would be disoccidentalized, yes, but it will be also disoriented. No possible orientation or direction. Loss of orientation is loss of universality because, because then signification will be tied to languages and we will be left with the plurality of languages in a decolonized or a post-colonial world and the verticality and elevation which are, as I said earlier, the mark of the universal, would be simply impossible. The only dimension which, which we would be left in that case would be the dimension of horizontality. Everything will be situated on the same plane. All cultures and languages would be absolutely equivalent, 
then you would not have anymore the possibility of the verticality or the elevation from which to talk about the universal. That would be the location of the universal. Such a situation will mean, I quote again Le Emmanuel Levinas, no direct or privileged contact with the word of ideas. Here his language is very Platonist language. No access to a universal grammar, but instead all we will have would be the possibility to, to go from one culture to penetrate another as one goes from one's mother tongue to learn another language. And of course, I'm interested in this metaphor of one going from one's mother language to learn another language in this kind of horizontal relationship between languages with no dimension of verticality and universality. And at that point, Levinas evokes another French philosopher, whom you know well, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And Merleau-Ponty, for him, is precisely the philosopher who spoke of the possibility of a lateral universality. And for Levinas, of course, a lateral universality would be a contradiction in terms. You cannot have a lateral universality if the only dimension for universality is verticality and elevation. If you are on a totally horizontal uh, uh, um, dimension, what would be the figure of this so-called horizontal or lateral universality? Now, before I examine what Merleau-Ponty did say himself, not as he is quoted by Levinas, and what his lateral universality uh, is in order to ask what is wrong with getting out of one's mother tongue to learn another language, <coughs> let me say a few words about the fact that the opposition uh, uh, that uh, is very strong in French academia, for example, to the, I quote here Jean-Francois Bayard, the academic carnival of post-colonial studies, somehow repeats Levinas' lament in the face of a word made of a saraband of countless equivalent cultures. In other words, what I'm saying here is that the opposition of the likes of Jean-Francois Bayard or Jean-Louis Amsel to what they see as some kind of conspiracy of the post-colonial studies uh, in those American universities uh, where uh, you know, a few African intellectuals find themselves and so on and so forth, they are actually repeating what Emmanuel Levinas said himself about a post-colonial world of equivalent cultures with no dimension of verticality and elevation to provide for universality. The very first pages of L'Occident des Crochets by anthropologist Jean-Louis Amsel echo the notion that a disoccidentalized word is ipso facto a disoriented word, a word upside down, to quote uh, 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 Jean-Louis Amsel, which is witnessing a supposed, and I quote here Jean-Louis Amsel, crumbling of the West with the concomitant competing rise of thoughts of philosophies which dispute to Europe and America their intention to dominate the world, which means, according to those who have for them nothing but contempt, questioning their pretension to universality." End of quote. <clears throat> and Amsel considers that the unhooking from the West, that is the meaning of décrocher, Occident décrocher, Occident uh, Western word, unhooked, he considered that the unhooking from the West, which is according to him what postcolonial and subalternist studies amount to, will mean the fragmentation of the word into provinces with the consequence that the untranslatable will reign supreme. In other words, the word that they fear, the word against which Amsel is writing in L'Occident des Crochets, would be precisely this word of a saraband of countless equivalent cultures, each of them justifying itself only within its own context, 
with no possibility of any kind of universal discourse that would be a discourse which is valid beyond the language in which it has been uh, 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 formulated. So for Amsel, the machine de guerre against universalism could be justified in a phase of decolonization, could be justified earlier in the 1950s and 1960s uh, from a Europe which colonized the rest of the world in the name of the universal, but not now. For example, one could think here of the very gesture of Aimé Césaire, and I am uh, thinking here of Aimé Césaire's letter he wrote in 1956, in which Aimé Césaire just resigned from the French Communist Party. If uh, for those of you who have read that letter from Césaire, if you remember, Césaire was protesting uh, against a certain uh, um, universalism of the left, uh, which was, for him, uh, not much better than the universalism from the right. In other words, if colonization happen in the name of the universal, of the universal culture, the discourse from the left against that discourse was itself a universalist discourse. The French Communist Party, to which uh, uh, Césaire belonged at the time, the reproach he had against the French Communist Party is that the French Communist Party believed in the universality of its own liberating uh, uh, power and struggle. Wait a minute, if I liberate the world, me, the universal class of the proletariat, I am going to bring liberation and everybody would be liberated, ipso facto. In some respect, you could even think that a colonial France, which would become communist, would be fine because just you would not have any more uh, 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 colonialism, but this universal class of the proletariat liberating everybody. And I, uh, if we remember uh, uh, Césaire's terms, what he was saying is that communist fraternalism, as he called it, was not much better than colonial paternalism. It was always the case that you would be the foot soldiers of some kind of universal struggle within which you would be just foot soldier precisely occupying your own particular place. And Césaire famously said, I am not trying to have any kind of incarcerating conception of my own particularity, but I do not want to be lost in this kind of leftist or communist universalism. I want to be and to recognize myself in the very uh, uh, struggle for emancipation. So this is what basically Amsel is saying. He is saying that it was right to have that kind of attitude in the 50s and the 60s when the time was the time of opposing to colonial uh, essentialism, some kind of strategic essentialism, to use the phrase from uh, my colleague and friend Gayatri Spivak, but he says now if we still use that language today, it would be counterproductive for the following reasons, and I quote uh, uh, Amsel. This is not justifiable anymore because now, quote, the prevailing situation in this beginning of 21st century is very different from that of the 1950s and 1960s. In the present context of clash of civilizations, or rather, in what looks more and more like a crusades conflict, strategic essentialism has become a problematic notion as the affirmation of a radical otherness can be perceived as the ferment of all fundamentalism. In the world we are now living in, apparently open, but in reality perfectly compartmentalized, we must abandon any definition or assertion of identity that restrains the circulation of enunciations through cultural boundaries, in other words, makes those boundaries exist as such by 
<coughs> reinforcing them. So what Amsel is saying, and it is something that is worth reflecting upon, is the very language of decolonization, of self-affirmation, of affirmation of oneself against this kind of uh, um, generalizing uh, universalism uh, that was the language of M. S. Césaire was fine then. If you speak that way now, you are playing the game of all fundamentalists, understood religious fundamentalists, because fundamentalism is precisely about that, dividing the word in block, cultural blocks and languages that are all equivalent, well, they don't think it, it, it is equivalent, actually. They think that they have the truth. But where you would believe that nothing can be translated into something else. You cannot have enunciations that would circulate from a fragment to another fragment. You would have a fragmented word, the nightmare that uh, Emmanuel Levinas described as a saraband of countless equivalent cultures. Let me say here that I am, I am in agreement with Amsel, with jean louis Amsel, more than he himself has acknowledged and more that one can conclude from the controversy which opposed me to him and which was over-dramatized by the fact that we were both at one point in, a, in, a, in, a, in the setting of France culture uh, and we had some kind of heated debate that keep coming up on, 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 on uh, social medias and exaggerated because I agree more with Jean-Louis Amsel than people would think because, because I do not advocate a word of fragments and insularities, a word of the untranslatable. On the contrary, this is the very basis for my own uh, 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 work on translation. I am basically looking for what Emmanuel Wallerstein has called for when he said that after the era of European universalism, we have to work on, I quote Emmanuel Wallerstein, a truly universal universalism and a language for, I quote him, universalizing our particulars and particularizing our universals in an open-ended process that would allow us to find new synthesis, end of uh, uh, quote. This comes from uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein's European Universalism, the Rhetoric of Power, published in 2006. It is, by the way, interesting that uh, when he ends his book, Emmanuel Wallerstein ends it on uh, Senghor, Leopold Sedar Senghor, for him, the best possible representative of this uh, task of trying to invent for our world a new, truly universal universalism, because he says uh, 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 Senghor uh, uh, is, in, it, in his thinking, this hybrid uh, 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 person, and in his, uh, his philosophy is about precisely metissage or hybridity. Now, I believe that such a truly universal universalism, to use the language of Emmanuel Wallerstein, echoes Merleau-Ponty's notion of a lateral universal that Emmanuel Levinas dismissed as a contradiction in terms. Now, here is what Merleau-Ponty says himself and not through uh, the, the lens of uh, Emmanuel Levinas. Merlo, I quote Merleau-Ponty uh, at length. The equipment of our social being can be dismantled and reconstructed by the voyage as we, have, as we are able to learn to speak other languages. <coughs> this provides a second way to the universal no longer the overarching universal of a strictly objective method, so no longer the universal defined by elevation and verticality of uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, 
but a sort of lateral universal which we acquire through ethnological experience and its incessant testing of the self through the other and the other person through the self. It is question of constructing a general system of reference in which the point of view of the native, the point of view of the civilized man, and the mistaken views each has of the other can all find a place that is of constituting a more comprehensive experience which becomes in principle accessible to men of a different time and country. End of quote. Of course, you have the language of the, of the time when Merleau-Ponty writes this. This is in the early 50s when you still speak about the civilized man and the primitive man. But what is important here is that Merleau-Ponty is taking into account the fact that the world is going towards a post-colonial situation where you would not have a language or a culture saying what is the direction to the rest of the world, which for Emmanuel Levinas means a disoriented world. In his case, Merleau-Ponty is saying, well, what we have to think about is this general system of reference where the point of view of the primitive and the point of view of the civilized would be point of views with possibilities of misunderstanding, mistaken views of each other. And this is the situation from which we have to build this possible lateral universal. First remark, the point made by Levinas in a dismissive way that this is like learning another language from one's mother tongue is precisely what Merleau-Ponty is stating here in a positive way. The call he is making is a call for the capacity to be in between languages, to be a translator. And that capacity for him is the lesson to be drawn from ethnology. He is looking at the discipline of ethnology and saying the work of the ethnologist is teaching us what we should be looking for in a post-colonial world, what this unilateral universal could look uh, 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 like. I'll come back to that in my conclusion. It is important to, quote, to note that the quote comes from the text he has devoted to his reflection on ethnology and is entitled from Marcel Mauss to Claude Lévi-Strauss. It is from his book, Science. It is important, and this is my second remark, <coughs> that lateral universal as translation does not mean transparency and the elimination of the untranslatable. We are not, I'm not going to say that, well, now the new universal is the universal of translation, and we will reach transparency for all over the world. We would understand each other through translation, et cetera, et cetera. This is not the case. We still have conflicts, conflicts of interpretation. There is still misunderstanding. That is what uh, Merleau-Ponty is saying. In other words, this is not the elimination of the untranslatable, but the task of, of continuously overcoming misunderstanding and untranslatables precisely. The untranslatable or the unavoidable misunderstandings or mistaken views about each other are part of this incessant testing marked by the co-presence of many different views. So lateral universality does not have as its horizon the establishment of a kind of universal grammar nor the end game of a final reduction of the plurality of the chaos word to one and the same homogeneous word. What does it mean to learn to speak other languages is a very complicated question. And trying to understand the task at hand the indication by Merleau-Ponty that this is the horizon for a post-colonial world is uh, uh, what I'm trying now to say 
in the second and last part of my uh, uh, lecture. So I'm going to question what it means to apply what Merleau-Ponty is calling for to the very uh, 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 discipline of philosophy. What is he learning from the practice of the ethnologist of being between languages and being a bridge or a translator, and what does that mean for the practice of philosophy? Let me take uh, an example in the history of philosophy. In his Traité des Systèmes, treaties about systems, uh, French philosopher Abbé de Condillac, uh, uh, philosopher of sensationalism, this idea that nothing can be in our understanding if it was not first in our senses. <coughs> uh, Abbé de Condillac, philosopher of sensationalism, has a criticism of Cartesian philosopher Malbranche. Malbranche is a Cartesian, so he believes in innate ideas, while Condillac is a sensationalist. For him, all our ideas have a sensible uh, uh, origin. But that is not the, the, the point. What he does, he uh, critically analyzes an argument made by, by Malbranche. To understand the argument, let me just explain very quickly what Malbranche philosophy is. The system of philosophy of Malbranche is known as occasionalism. Occasionalism means that for him, in his system, there is only one single cause, which is God. Only God can truly be a cause. Now, when we talk about the plurality of causes, when you say, for example, that your neighbor is disturbing you, your neighbor is stepping on your foot, etc., etc., actually, no. It is God who is stepping on your foot <laughs> through the occasion of your neighbor. Okay? So uh, uh, file your complaint to God. God is the only cause. The fire burns with the permission of God. If God did not want it, the fire would not burn you. So this is how miracles happen. Usually, God is consistent enough. Anytime there is fire, he is consistent enough to make it burn. But after all, he could decide that fire doesn't burn from now on after uh, uh, June 9, okay? Just in Germany, let's say. He could do that. In other words, one cause and only occasions. Of course, the theological question which is raised immediately is then how is sin possible? If God is the only cause, how come Adam and Eve had the by, by, uh, uh, bad idea of eating that bloody apple? <laughs> At least if it was strawberry, we could understand, but apple, who would just disobey to eat apple and with all the consequences? So. The answer of Malbranche is to say, well, God has put in us natural inclinations, and our natural inclinations put in us by God always go to the good and the true. But it is the same, and he builds this analogy, with matter. If you take the principle of inertia in physics, the principle of inertia says that if a movement is started, if nothing comes across, is, if nothing impedes, it is going to continue identically to itself until something stops it. In the same way, says Malbranche, our natural inclination goes towards the truth and the good unless, unless some extra news cause is actually disturbing that. So for him, the analogy between matter's capacity for being moved and the inclination of the will originally given by God offers a clear understanding of a response to be made to the theological, philosophical question. And the answer could be this. As matter moves in a straight line, unless diverted by an opposing force, all inclinations tend towards goodness and truth unless acted upon 
by an external cause. Now you are going to understand why I'm talking about Malbranche and Condillac after I talked about universality in a post-colonial world. Condillac answers to the argument made by Malbranche that all his reasoning rests upon the fact that actually he is speaking and writing French. He says, your reasoning depends on the accident whereby the adjective droit in French happens to possess a vague, abstract, moral sense as well as a precise, concrete, physical sense. In other words, the whole argument made by Malbranche comes from the fact that when I say God put in me une, incliné, une inclination droite in French, I am using the same word droite to say straight than I would be using by saying a movement continues en ligne droite in a straight line unless it is impeded by some extraneous cause. Condillac is saying, well, pay attention to your own language. Your argument is entirely built on the fact that in French, droit, feminine droite, happens to have both this physical sense of something straight and this moral sense of something straight. By the way, you have the same thing in English because I've been translating straight without any problem. I would expect that you have the same thing in German. A straight line and someone morally straight? No. I see Tatiana who is saying no, so I have a tendency to believe Tatiana. So Kondiak concludes that the argument would crumble if Malbranche had been speaking another language when you do not have that linguistic peculiarity. So I will not examine the discussion in any detail. That is not my goal. But you see why I am interested in this example and why I'm interested in making the two <coughs> following points. <clears throat> First point. Condillac is calling Malbranche attention to the fact that he is speaking in French and that the peculiarities of that language inclines him to think in a certain way according to the possibilities that the very language presents. But there is nothing necessary and universal in those peculiarities by definition. Philosophy leaves nothing unexamined. That is the definition of philosophy. You just do not accept anything. You don't never take anything for granted. You do not let anything unexamined except the very fact that you are speaking a particular language and the language you are speaking is just one language among other languages. The language in which we happen to philosophize has the capacity to incline us to think in a certain inexamined way. Second point, which is implicit in Condillac criticism, the invitation he is making is to always translate. In other words, he invites somehow Malbranche to just pose the question, now what if I were speaking or writing another language? Let me try to translate what I just said in a language different in that it would not offer the same uh, 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 possibility of metaphorically using uh, uh, straight in a different way. I am tempted to generalize this and to say that the invitation is to always think in the presence of a plurality of languages. In other words, to remember that to philosophize is to undergo the test of translation. Edouard Glissant famously wrote and declared, j'écris en présence de toutes les langues du monde. I write in the presence of all the languages of the world. Obviously, this is not the case. He could not possibly speak all the languages of the world. But to say that, is to say two different things. I always write with the consciousness that my language is one language among other languages. 
And then I always ask myself, what would what I am saying become if translated in a totally different language? And that is the posture, I believe, that uh, uh, um, Merleau-Ponty's notion of lateral universal is inviting us to adopt. Of course, philosophers have always known that there are different languages, that there is a task to translate. Cicero do, did that with Greek philosophy. Uh, Arabic philosophers did that with Greek philosophy. <coughs> we have talked about that and we have discussed it. So they do know that Babel happened and that since Babel, we, have, we are living in a state of dispersion with many different languages. But there was still this notion that there is such a thing as a logos, this language which could be somehow detached from the plurality of languages, the language that Levinas had in mind and that Heidegger has in mind when he talks about a historical uh, 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 language, a language with historiality like Greek or, 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 or German. <clears throat> This is different from the notion of philosophizing in tongues, taking into account right from the beginning the plurality of languages and the fact that I always speak or write or think in a language which is one language among other languages. Uh, philosophizing in tongues is an expression I borrow from Barbara uh, uh, Cassin. Uh, uh, I mentioned her already as uh, uh, someone whose work is very important for me, uh, reflecting on, on, on translation. She uses that biblical expression of philosophizing in tongues, which conveys the double, the double idea that first, before they are concepts, our concepts are words, words in some given languages inscribed in certain uh, uh, linguistic uh, practices. And second, if universal there is, uh, the difference between uh, Barbara Cassin and what I try to work on is that she assumes relativism. She calls it a consistent relativism, okay? The relativism of the untranslatable. I, like Amsel, try to work out some new definition of the universal, one that would not be the overarching one, but a lateral one, and uh, which is the same as translation. When uh, uh, um, the assumption uh, being here that there is no logos standing in its universal separation. The example I gave of Condillac uh, criticizing Malbranche was the example of one single word, the word straight. The best possible examples for this, uh, for untranslatability and the fact that our thinking is very much connected with the language that we speak would not be on words, as in this case, but on full statements. In particular, statements that we find in the history of philosophy that involve the verb to be. Let me take two famous examples. Uh, uh, being is, not being is not. Parmenides, which is supposed to be the origin of philosophical thinking. Being is, not being is not. Uh, or nothing is not. How do you say that in, in German? Sein ist? Sein ist? Not being. Nicht sein, uh, nicht. Okay, yeah. I, and, or other, other example, I think therefore I am. Of course, you can have problems translating uh, Indo-European languages uh, from one another. But the problem is even more so if you are looking at languages that are totally not Indo-European. Languages in which, for example, the verb to be is not used in the same way or doesn't, have the same, doesn't offer the same possibility of being used in an absolute way. As I said, I think it was my previous lecture or the le lecture before, in many languages when you say I am, I think therefore I am, you cannot just say I am. I am is not the equivalent of I exist. If you are, you have to be, to say what you are, where you are, 
in what position, next to whom, etc., etc. You could follow the path of logical analysis of language here and say, well, let me look at what I truly say logically when I say being is and not being is not. The path of analytical philosophy, for an, for an analytic philosopher, this just doesn't make sense, actually. If you follow uh, the, the, the reflection uh, starting with Kant on the fact that existence cannot be a predicate, is not a real predicate, you can analyze logically these sentences and say that they do not have any kind of <coughs> denotation. This is one path to go in terms of uh, analysis of these uh, uh, languages. But what I uh, want to pay attention more to here is not to follow the path of analytic philosophy, but look at uh, what is involved in the capacity a, a language gives us to pronounce, to enunciate these statements, I think, therefore, I am, or being is, not being is, not. Uh, Rwandan philosopher Alexis Kagame, that I have already uh, quoted, who in his book, La Philosophie Bantu Rwandaise de Lettres, uh, uh, has um, looked at these forms of enunciation and has famously, famously declared that actually uh, Descartes, I think, therefore I am, cannot be translated into his own uh, 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 language for the reasons that I have indicated, and I mentioned it last time as well. In fact, there is always a way. You can always find a way of translating. So when he says you cannot translate it in Kenya Rwandan, it is both true and not true. True in the sense that you may not have the same use of the copula to be, but it is not true in the sense that a language finds always a way of translating, rendering something. And I am here talking under the control of many translators here, one of them being Maria sitting right here. Uh, what I, uh, uh, one could answer if you are a Heideggerian philosopher, uh, very much into historiality of your own language, what you could say to Alexis Kagame would be to say, well, it is no surprise that your Kenya Rwandan underdeveloped language cannot just translate this. You are speaking Kenya Rwandan. You're not speaking Greek, you're not speaking German. So your language is not hospitable to being. Being inhabits historical language. I'm here paraphrasing uh, um, Heidegger. Or you could be more generous, that is to say Nietzschean, and say, according to Nietzsche, Nietzsche, you say Nietzsche in, in German, Nietzsche, that actually it is a question of what he calls a grammatical philosophy. Each language for him is a certain grammatical philosophy. I have evoked already this passage from Nietzsche's uh, 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 beyond good and evil, and I have uh, uh, read it already, the passage in which, or have I? The passage in which he makes this difference with uh, 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 philosophical uh, uh, grammar. Are we trapped with the philosophical grammar of our languages? I have used the verb to incline the fact that a certain language inclines us to think and speak in a certain way. But to incline is not to necessitate. In other words, if I am saying that because I speak Wolof, I necessarily have to think a certain way because of the grammatical philosophy of Wolof, that would be total entrapment and incarcerating conception of the identity of a language. But to say that it inclines me to think a certain way, and at the same time say that I can overcome that inclination through translation is what I am trying to, uh, 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 to say. The task of cultivating the capacity to go back and forth between languages, to acknowledge philosophical uh, 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 grammars in order to overcome them, go beyond them,
is the task of translation and the task of uh, delivering this universal lateral. That is the invitation expressed in the journey of the Dictionary of Untranslatables, uh, 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 produced by Barbara Cassin, to discover that every language is always a language among others. We have to learn how to think from language to language or between languages in an approach that is bearing some analogy with the work of Francois Julien, for example, working between French and Chinese. And this example brings me to some kind of, uh, the, the kind of pedagogical utopia I mentioned earlier, the utopia that everybody learns always a totally foreign language, not just another Indo-European language. I believe that, and I have had the explanation of Tatiana about the fact that here, uh, pedagogically, this, uh, the policy of learning other languages is always uh, a, a political question as well. And I believe that in that case, learning to think also from a radically different perspective, which means a radically different language, would be the best way of stepping out of one own and examined ways of uh, uh, thinking. So if Plato's academia demanded that no one enters if they, do, they are not geometers, we could have another utopia asking that no one enters here if they do not know a radically other uh, uh, language. This is not total utopia because we Africans live that situation. And many other uh, cultures leave that situation of having to make this grand écart, as we say in French, between languages that share, that do not share the same uh, uh, grammatical philosophy. It is something that ethnologists also do, and I believe that this is the lesson that Merleau-Ponty asked philosophers to learn from ethnologists. And I thought that having been uh, uh, so kindly invited by ethnologists and by the Institute, the Frobenius Institute, to think with you on translation, it would be appropriate for me to end on this particular lesson that ethnology and the humanism of ethnology has to teach everybody, and in particular philosophers, which is to live between languages. Thank you so much.